the state is the monopolist on trust is the institution that wants to monopolize trust and the way um, it uses to monopolize trust is the education system for example uh, it is the way the uh, people accept uh, the use of paper as a currency of paper that has no value just because they trust the state they trust that uh, the state can uh, do good and uh, work uh, um, work on their behalf the, uh, this is just a sad reality so education is important but unfortunately i think that at least institutional education um, has been um, uh, has been uh, captured by uh, by the state Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by... Monero.com wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on iOS and Android too. Monero.com wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN, a privacy focused, audited, and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. Monero.com wallet and IVPN are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your cake wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Andrea Togni. Andrea is a philosophy and history teacher by day and Monero Policy Workgroup member by night. The two discuss Andrea's involvement with the Monero Policy Workgroup why privacy is a necessary condition for the defense and even for the existence of property rights, how governments monopolize trust through education, what the U.S. Treasury's press release on the tornado cash ban means for the Monero community, and much more. On that note, please consider participating in the New York City privacy protest this Halloween in Washington Square Park at 6 p.m. Unite to fight for a right to privacy and to uphold the cypherpunk ideology of code being speech. No matter what crypto bags you hold, you are encouraged to join us. Go to Monerotopia.com to learn how to anonymously participate and claim your free mask. Monero Talk starts now. All right, Andrea, what's going on, man? Everything is good. How are you? Good, man. Good, good, good. Like I said, this is this is when my day really starts. You know, it's the nine to five is just uh, me working up to the the real part of my day, which is when I get into the Monero things. Great. It's, we are Monero people, so. <laughs> do you, you have like a, a regular day a day job unrelated to Monero as well? Is is that your your situation as well? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, I'm a teacher. I teach history and philosophy. Uh, so okay. I have a regular job uh, here in Italy. Uh, but Monero and uh, also Bitcoin and uh, privacy uh, are my passions. So uh, this what, what, kind of, uh, yeah, this research what, in, the, in the privacy space is uh, uh, the best stuff I can do. Awesome. What, what uh, grades do you teach? Uh, high school, high schools. Uh, so uh, it's like uh, uh, 14 to uh, 18 years. Very cool, man. And you teach history and philosophy. So that obviously that's what you're what you studied as well. You have a I think you have a PhD in philosophy, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I earned a PhD in 2018, uh, working on the philosophy of uh, of perception. Uh, since then, I started teaching uh, at an Italian high school, but uh, I also uh, went down into the uh, um, privacy rabbit hole, into Monero, into Bitcoin. And so I started uh, researching on those topics. And so uh, here I am. <laughs> what led you down the privacy rabbit hole? Was it that you went down the cryptocurrency rabbit hole and found your way to Monero or, or you went down the privacy rabbit hole and found your way to Monero? 
Well, uh, actually both, uh, because um, it's true that I worked on the uh, philosophy of perception first, mm -hmm. but I, w I was always interested in political philosophy, especially uh, especially in uh, American libertarian f philosophers like uh, Rothbard, Walt uh, Walter Bloch, uh, Hermann Hoppe, uh, also agorists, like for, for example, Conkin the Third uh, and stuff like that. So, uh, of course, I uh, found uh, uh, my home in the uh, crypto space, in the original uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, mood and cypherpunk uh, ethos, and of course, in the uh, Monero ethos. Uh, and also, uh, I arrived uh, at uh, Monero through the uh, gold and silver, um, um, uh, because in 2017, I started being interested in uh, uh, the economics uh, uh, of liberty and of property. So I became a gold and silver bug. And then also uh, I discovered Monero and uh, then Bitcoin. Uh, so uh, here I am. I'm, I'm still a gold and silver bug, but uh, of course, Monero is my favorite coin. Uh, uh, what, why why is Monero your favorite coin? Well, yeah, because arrive at Monero. Why, why Monero? Why not? Why not Bitcoin? Why not uh, Zcash? Why? <laughs> yeah, be, uh, I think uh, uh, because of the same reasons uh, uh, you like Monero too. So uh, because of privacy, uh, because I think that. Uh, um, Probably you cannot have good money without uh, some strong uh, privacy uh, by default. I don't think that privacy is just a cool feature to have uh, for, uh, for a cryptocurrency. Uh, it's not uh, a feature among others. I don't think uh, either that uh, it is a, a privacy from a political perspective is just a right among others, like for example, the right to free speech and stuff like that. I think that privacy is way more important than this. For example, uh, in the, uh, in the um, currency space, in the money space, uh, I think that, and especially in the uh, digital uh, money space, uh, privacy is a necessary condition for the existence of money. I think that uh, money cannot exist without strong privacy. Then, of course, we can discuss about what kind of privacy uh, should money have and stuff like that. But I think that um, a strong level of privacy is needed in order to uh, be money. And uh, so this is why I'm naturally at attracted to Monero, because of that. Philosophically, uh, why? Why is that the case that you, you need privacy for money to work? What's, what's the reasoning there? What's the logic behind that? Yeah, because uh, mainly, uh, as I try to explain it, uh, at my uh, Monero Corn presentation, um, because privacy is a condition for the enjoyment of property rights. Uh, of course, if you are a libertarian, if you accept the uh, libertarian background, the libertarian basic concept that uh, there is only uh, one uh, uh, na natural right, uh, okay. obviously, uh, that is the right to property then you have to find uh, uh, which conditions uh, are to be defended in order to uh, enjoy property rights. Of course, if, you have proper, if property is a natural right, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, it cannot be attacked by enemies. So you have to find ways to uh, defend pro uh, property from en enemies. And uh, I think that in the digital space, privacy is the main tool, not only for the defense of property right, but also for the uh, very existence of property right. I'll just make you an example to, uh, make it clear, to, to make it clear. Both in Bitcoin and in Monero, we have, uh, we have uh, private keys. Right, uh, and uh, if those private keys are not private anymore, that means that you don't own your uh, coins anymore. Basically, uh, privacy is necessary uh, at some point, at some level. Uh, I'm open to discuss what kind of uh, privacy we need in order to uh, to be good money, but privacy is needed in order for uh, um, in order for property to exist in the digital re uh, realm. So it's not just a cool feature, just a feature that can be added on a layer two, maybe. I think that privacy should be really uh, be the basic of a good currency, of good mm. money. Yeah, I often say, you know, without privacy, we no longer have our individuality. And it's, you know, uh, you know if, you, if, you, if, you really, if you really think about it in the most extreme case, right? Uh, without privacy, we no longer have our, our own personal thoughts, our own inner thoughts, uh, our ability to communicate just between, uh, you know, individuals of choice. And if all of that erodes, we are, are we 
able to be individuals anymore. And I guess that's one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why privacy is a, is a fundamental right, right? It's, it's uh, literally what gives us our humanity and individuality. Absolutely, absolutely. It is, it is a precondition for property, which is uh, uh, the nature of human being. Of, of human beings. Mm -hmm. Human beings cannot exist without property, without the property of, of their own body, of their own minds, and of course, of the goods that they earn uh, during their lives. So uh, privacy is very important with, in that regard from an individualistic point of view, but also from a social point of view. Privacy is trust. Privacy is needed in order to uh, communicate, to interact with others uh, socially in a free manner without uh, being coerced. Um, um, Again, uh, uh, just uh, um, uh, a little example. Uh, when, we think of, uh, uh, when we think about Bitcoin, we think about peer-to-peer -peer money. But what does peer-to-peer -peer means? Peer-to-peer -peer means that there are two peers that interact with each other. There is peer A and peer B. But if there is a third party, uh, uh, even an observer that, uh, doesn't, uh, that, that doesn't use violence against the two original peers, even if there is just an observer, of course, the interaction between the two, the two original peers is not free anymore. Because, of course, if there is someone that is looking at us, we can uh, feel uh, some sort of chilling effect. Uh, we may not feel co comfortable in interacting, uh, in interacting with, with each other. So uh, I think that privacy is really needed in order for free interaction and uh, uh, for uh, uh, the um, for, uh, and for building uh, a good society a free society uh, and also if we apply that to money money is very important to exchange value uh, in, inside society uh, I, I would say that uh, there wouldn't be society maybe without money money is uh, again um, a necessary condition, at least, uh, for the existence of, uh, of a human society. And uh, if money is not built well, then uh, we end up with uh, the wrong kind of society, which is, uh, which is a tyrannical society, uh, um, a society that despises freedom. So I think that if we can bring together privacy on the one end and money on the other, it will be great of course, for, uh, for, uh, for all of us. And Monero is here with that, I, I hope. Did, so what, what did the, the Austrians say about privacy then? Just basically what you're saying is that it was, it's, it's fundamental to supporting uh, um, property as a, as a fundamental right? Without pro is, that, is that the analysis that's often given in that philosophical realm? What's, is there any yeah. other reasoning that, 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 they, that they provide? Yeah, actually, uh, I find it kind of surprising that uh, both libertarians and uh, um, uh, and, uh, Austrian, uh, and Austrian economists don't give so much space to privacy. For example, uh, classic, uh, classical libertarians, like, uh, like, for example, Rothbard, is pretty clear in his text that uh, there, is not, uh, uh, there is not such a thing as a right to privacy. It right. I, I realized as I was saying, I slipped up and said the right to privacy. But you, you, as yeah. you, you're saying there is none. Well, I don't I don't know. We could get into whether or not I agree with that. But yeah, try to convince me as to why uh, yeah. it's just the right to, um, you know, property and, yeah. and privacy. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, if you're a libertarian, you think that uh, only property is a natural right. OK, so. Um, for example, um, all other right, and that means that all other rights are derived from the right to property. For example, free speech is not a fundamental right at the same level as property rights, in the sense that free speech is, is just a consequence of the fact that we own our body and our mind, and therefore we are allowed to uh, uh, talk freely and to express our thoughts. But it would be an error to put uh, the freedom of speech, uh, the, the right to a free speech and the right to property at the same level. The right to free speech is derived from the right of property. Uh, the same goes for privacy. For example, uh, uh, Rothbard uh, makes this example. Um, uh, let's say that uh, you want to discredit my person, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to talk mean uh, uh, about me uh, to other people. Um, it would be wrong for me to um, um, forbid you to talk about my person uh, because, of course, you own your mind, you own your body, and therefore you are free to express whatever talks uh, you want about my person. 
If I want to forbid you to talk, to talk about me just because I have a right to privacy or, or whatever that is, I would, in fact, uh, attack your property rights, which, of course, would be wrong uh, from uh, a libertarian uh, perspective. So, again, uh, privacy cannot be considered a right at the same level of, uh, of uh, property. Of course, Rothbard, uh, uh, Rothbard kind of stops here and, uh, uh, and uh, doesn't give uh, a proper space uh, to uh, privacy. I think that he's correct in saying that privacy is not a property right, but that doesn't mean that privacy has, uh, has not a role in libertarian thought. Quite the contrary. As I stated before, I think that privacy is, an, is, an, is a condition for the defense of property rights. And then we can discuss what kind of property rights there exist. We can, uh, of course, we can distinguish between the property of our, of our body. Uh, it is one thing uh, which is different uh, um, from the uh, property of external objects, like, for example, this laptop or uh, the, uh, the laptop that uh, I'm using right now or your mic and stuff like that, which is different from, proper, uh, from property in the digital realm and so on and so forth. So um, we can say that privacy is important to defend these different kind of properties. Uh, we can discuss how it is important, how it can be used to defend these different kind of proper, kinds of property. Uh, but I think that especially in the digital realm, uh, that is also in the cryptocurrency sphere, I think that privacy Again, it's not only a condition for the defense of property rights, it is also a condition of existence of property rights. Uh, you cannot have any property, any digital property, uh, without privacy in the digital realm. You, can, you cannot have digital cash without privacy. So uh, I can both say that privacy is not a natural right at the same level of property rights, but uh, that doesn't mean that privacy is not important. Quite the contrary, privacy is a very important condition for both the defense of property rights and also in some cases for the existence of property rights. And so I think that, uh, for example, the view uh, of uh, a lot of Bitcoiners according to, who, uh, to whom uh, privacy is just a nice feature that can be added uh, at a later stage is a very dangerous view because... Uh, I mean, without privacy, you cannot really enjoy your property and also your money. For example, you can hold your private keys in Bitcoin, but if uh, the fact that uh, your, uh, you own Bitcoin is public and is known to uh, men with guns uh, uh, is uh, publicly available, then men with, guns, uh, uh, men with guns will come at you and it will be very easy for them to strip away your property. So I think that uh, the more the privacy, the better. So, uh, you know, the, how about the argument that's, that's made in, in Bitcoin in that it's a trade-off and that they're not willing to sacrifice, uh, you know, auditability for, you know, the nice-to-have feature of, of privacy? What's your, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, everything is a, is a trade-off. Of course, you can choose to, uh, uh, to go public and to... Um, Exposed to the world or your um, financial possessions, uh, um, you can do that. You can choose to uh, try to be as much private as possible. Of course, everything in the world uh, is a trade-off. But uh, I think that uh, at one point, uh, um, privacy uh, goes beyond the uh, trade-off level, if uh, I say so. Um, I like to. I, I, I really like uh, Rothbard take, for example, uh, on uh, uh, on slavery, and I, I, I try to explain why this is important also for privacy. For example, Rothbard says that on slavery we we must be abolitionists. Com we cannot discuss about uh, the fact that slavery may be good in some in some circumstance or may be bad in some other circumstance. Why? Well, because. Pro the property of the body and, and of the mind is a natural right of the people. So we cannot discuss about the importance of uh, uh, body ownership. And uh, we cannot say that, well, maybe slavery is a good thing, uh, is somehow a good thing. I think that the same unapologetic approach should be held also with regard to privacy. Privacy is, is something that is embedded in human nature. I wouldn't call it uh, a natural right, but natural for us. And uh, uh, if you want to attack privacy, you are you, you want to attack human uh, uh, human nature in its own essence. Uh, 
And um, therefore, yeah, maybe it is a trade-off. Uh, uh, maybe Monero um, uh, buys this trade-off and uh, um, it is not as much auditable as, uh, as uh, um, uh, Monero is not ma as much as audit uh, auditable as Bitcoin, even though, of course, we can discuss about it. We can bring up a lot of arguments and stuff like that. Uh, but still, I think that it's a trade-off uh, uh, worth doing. Uh, and also, I think that uh, uh, we should really stop thinking about privacy as something that can be dispensed with even hypothetically. This is not the case. This is not the case. And uh, I think that also the Tornado Cash situation shows it, uh, shows it pretty well. And uh, all the discussion that we have for, about the concept of plausible deniability on the fact that we should be able to deny that we are using a privacy tool. I mean, these kind of discussions are, are, are really bad for, 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 from a certain point of view. And if you want, I, I can expand on it later. How about, you know, uh, what, the, what the potential negative implications are for, you know, perfect privacy, especially for a tool for transacting? Um, you know, how, how do we uh, justify those, you know, allowing, a allowing for a technology that could be used for evil things, you know? So how, how is that justification made, right? Uh, you know? national security right the funding of, of terrorism uh you yeah. know it could be used for all types of bad things how do you uh in a philosophical sense uh, explain why we should essentially be okay with the fact that a tool can be used for for those purposes yeah in this case uh oh Punk. Uh, if you uh, read the Cypherpunk Manifesto by Timothy May, he clearly states that, uh, well, uh, a, cypherpunk re a cypherpunk revolution is coming and that uh, uh, privacy is uh, a crucial tool for, uh, for cypherpunks and for the technology that uh, they were building. Uh, of course, Privacy has this implication. Uh, the, um, uh, for example, may um, uh, mention the possibility that uh, uh, a market for uh, um, uh, for uh, um, uh, killing people would arise exactly because uh, uh, people that would want to buy other people to kill again other people would have uh, uh, can have a way to pay them privately. Uh, and I think that uh, I mean this is just human nature. Uh, everyone then think uh, everyone that thinks that uh, uh, human nature is um, uh, uh, perfect uh, is uh, somehow good uh, and always good i mean is just uh, he's just dreaming uh, human nature is also made of uh, uh, this kind of bad behaviors and uh, we need to accept it and uh, when i hear philosophers that uh, uh, propose uh, a, a perfect society a utopian society when there is a very good regulators uh, that uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, cancel all the evil uh, from the world uh, i mean it's just very fishy because they are just promising something that uh, cannot exist also with regard to these arguments about national securities of course we have crime in the world, which is bad, we uh, must do whatever we can in order to stop uh, to stop crime. You are talking with a libertarian, so I think that uh, property is a natural right, uh, and uh, of course, I think that uh, any aggression against property must be condemned and must be uh, stopped as far as we can. Of course, so I'm not defending crime, but. Uh, um, Usually, the people that, that bring up this kind of argument about national security and stuff like that, I mean, they are just the worst criminal in the world. Uh, if you take, for example, I don't know, the US government or the Italian government, they just do wars all around the world. We are, witness, we are witnessing them, uh, them nowadays. I can mention Libya, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and of course, the war in Ukraine. I mean, those people, the people in power, of, often are the worst criminal that, uh, that exist. Actually, as anarcho-capitalists would say, uh, even the, the tool of taxation, for example, is a crime in itself. The government exists just because of a crime. It is just um, robbing the people of their own property without their consent. So, I mean, again, human nature is not perfect. Bad behavior must be condemned. But we should be very, care be very, very careful uh, uh, regarding the people that we want to fight crime. Because usually the people that want a monopoly on, uh, uh, legit uh, on legitimate vi violence are the worst people of them all. 
very, I hope I answered. Very, very well said, man. Very well <laughs> said. Uh, I'm convinced. I, I certainly agree with everything you're saying. But how do we express these philosophies to the masses in a way where they start to agree as well? Because ultimately, that's what we're up against, right? It's the the, the campaign of, of of government and the status versus you know the campaign of essentially uh, libertarian minded people uh, and trying to convince the masses that you know the power is in their hands if they want it. They just have to realize the importance of of liberty and and kind of vote in ways that preserves their liberty, uh, but they're often fooled into giving away. Uh, or, you know, or it's taken away out of for, for conveniences, uh, where people not, not realize is, you know, what they're sacrificing. How do we get these messages across to the masses? Is it necessary to get it across to the masses for, for things like Monero to prevail? What, what's your, what's your take there? Yeah, that's, that's a very complicated issue. And, um, it has to do with, uh, um, the strategy for liberty that we want to uh, that we want to deploy. Of course, traditional libertarians are very um, um, always stress the importance of the of education. What you are doing right now with your podcast and uh, what you're doing with uh, Monertopia with Moner Talk is very important because uh, just spreads the message of liberty, of property, or, or of privacy, of freedom. So uh, education is very important, but unfortunately, in this regard, I'm really not that optimistic. Uh, and the reason is that uh, I'm a teacher. <laughs> so uh, I work in the uh, education field and uh, um, uh, together with uh, um, uh, institutions uh, in, the, in this field. And uh, I can tell you that at least in Italy, um, uh, the state controls everything about uh, education. I'm, I'm simplifying it. Uh, we can discuss about the, uh, some legal aspects about the, uh, regarding this statement. But basically, all the education, we, we can say that uh, most of the education is controlled by the state. This is true at the uh, elementary level, at the high school level, at the university level. And um, so they did a, re a very good job uh, to control education. And um, I would also say that uh, usually the uh, most common definition of uh, what a state is, is uh, the state is uh, the uh, legitimate uh, uh, monopolist on, on violence. I think that this definition is correct, but there is a more important definition because I would say that the state is the monopolist on trust, is the institution that wants to monopolize trust. And the way um, it uses to monopolize trust is the education system. Um, and we are witnessing it nowadays. You in America are uh, a little bit more lucky that uh, as a Europeans because we, uh, you have uh, more freedom in, uh, uh, in this field. But I think that the education system, I mean, is uh, uh, the way uh, the state uh, is being able to convince people to give up their rights, their privacy, their liberty, their property. Uh, for example, uh, it is the way the uh, people accept uh, the use of paper as a currency of paper that has no value. Value, just because they trust the state. They trust that uh, the state can uh, do good and uh, work, uh, um, work on their behalf. The, uh, this is just a sad reality. So education is important, but unfortunately, I think that at least institutional education um, has been, um, uh, has been uh, captured by, uh, by the state. Okay? Uh, of course, education does not equal institutional education. We can do a lot of education outside institutional uh, institutional places like university and uh, and uh, schools and stuff like that. And uh, this is why I love the internet. Uh, and uh, this is why I listen to podcasts. Uh, this is why I read a lot of stuff on Twitter and stuff like that. So we can still spread the word uh, about privacy and liberty, but uh, be very careful about institutional education. Uh, also. The, but I think that in the end, the most important thing about uh, um, uh, getting the message of privacy and liberty uh, winning is about using these kind of tools, using this kind of tools. Uh, because uh, if we use privacy tools, for example, Monero, uh, or uh, other privacy tool in other fields, like, I don't know, messaging apps, uh, VPN, store, uh, stuff like that. I mean, we are uh, leading by example. And uh, yeah, words are important. 
I mean, I'm a philosopher. I use a lot of words, maybe too much. But uh, what really matters are actions. And if people uh, act in a way that preserve the liberty and their property, then they can lead by example uh, and they can bring other people with them. And uh, in that case, if enough people uh, use those privacy tools, then men with guns uh, cannot just impose their will with violence. So I think that acting uh, should be uh, the main concern. And uh, this is the agorist lecture. Uh, the, the, the agorist le uh, lecture. Okay, so this is what uh, the black markets uh, are uh, are all about, uh, and also this uh, uh, this is why I don't see the banning of tornado cash and uh, and maybe the possible ban of Monero as a bad thing. I mean, it, it is supposed to be uh, to work in the black market. So let's give it a try. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. Um, I don't know if you saw we're trying to put together a protest in New York privacy. Yeah. Protest. I heard of it. Yeah. So, what do you think of that? Do you think that's uh, a waste of of time, and that you know we should just be head down, cypherpunks, building you know uh, online dark marketplaces and and just using it, and and not worry, and not not try to fight the fight against you know the government. Um, what, what's your take on that? Well, uh, not at all. I think that both ways are pretty cool. We can go full cypherpunk and uh, use privacy tool and try to protect our privacy and uh, the privacy of people that we care about. And I think that we can uh, that uh, we can um, set up a protest like uh, like you're doing. I think that it's very important. Maybe uh, it will convince some people of the value of privacy. And uh, even in the worst case scenario where, uh, where nobody will listen to, uh, to your speakers and to, uh, and to the progress uh, and, to the pro and to the protest, maybe some, state, uh, some statist will be pissed off. So <laughs> uh, uh, that will be a good result and, uh, uh, in itself. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally see it as a, as a way to, you know, just get the message across to people that are hopefully going to witness it in some form and start to change their thinking, you know, start to become a thought in their mind. Uh, it, it, it only happens if people come across these ideas. So it's just a way to, to get the ideas out there. Um, yeah, I, I mean, normalize right, right. it, you know, no, start, start to normalize. I, I make those arguments as well. You know, we, like, and like you said, we got to use it, right? Use it on the dark markets, but we also have to um, use it in the day to day and normalize it and show people that there should be absolutely nothing wrong with using Monero, accepting Monero, asking for payment in Monero. We shouldn't act like we're, we're using an illegal tool. We're using a, a righteous and, 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 and a morally righteous tool. And we should be out there using it proudly. And if and if we're not allowed to, that's that's the problem. Not that we're using it, right? Absolutely, I, I completely agree. I, I would say that privacy is like insurance. You don't need it until you need it, and uh, when you need it, it's usually too late. So um, it's better for people to uh, get used to the idea to uh, to get private because otherwise it will be too late. And uh, unfortunately, again, the state uh, has been able to convince people that the state is good and uh, the people should trust the state. And therefore, uh, the people usually think that men with guns will only act against other people and bad people. And of course, they are not among, the, uh, um, among this group. But uh, I mean, I think that uh, uh, this is just, uh, I mean, uh, a utopic thinking as, 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 as something that um, at least it's not empirically true at, uh, at the very least. And if I may add something, and uh, I think that uh, uh, what you were saying uh, is, uh, is really, really important. I mean, privacy is righteous in itself. And so we shouldn't deny the fact that we are using uh, a privacy tool like, uh, like Monero or like, uh, or like Tornado Cash. I, I, I always hear this expression of, uh, of pl plausible deniability, which is a very important concept from a legal point of view. I understand the fact that legally speaking, uh, 
We must be able, we should be able uh, to deny the fact that we are using those privacy tool because, tools because otherwise the government will, uh, will come after us. And this is what's happening right now with, uh, with, uh, with Tornado Cash. And so I understand this kind of discussion. For example, you had a, a, really, a really cool dis- a discussion about this with Giacomo and Seth uh, on, on, your, on your podcast. It was, it was a very important discussion. But from an ethical and from a rhetorical point of view, we should be completely unapologetic about our use of privacy tools like Monero and Tornado Cash. We shouldn't be ashamed. We shouldn't deny anything about it. We should be very proud of our using uh, of our use of uh, of Tornado Cash because uh, and of Monero because basically, I mean, privacy is something that belongs to human nature in itself. And so we are not doing we are not doing some, uh, anything wrong. It's again, it's the same as the example of, of slavery. Libertarians in the early um, uh, early nineteenth century were very unapologetic about their, oppos- uh, their, their opposition against slavery, and uh, and uh, and uh, many gradualist uh, thinkers uh, thought that uh, they were uh, somehow uh, misled. Uh, the, uh, the, they thought that uh, well, maybe we should debate how we should handle the issue of slavery and stuff like that. But of course, the only the, the only right answer against uh, 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 regarding slavery is to, is to be against it and in favor of property rights. And again, the, the same holds with regard to privacy. We should be completely in favor of privacy without uh, being uh, ashamed of that. And also, uh, uh, w- 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 what really matters here is the word plausible. What is plausible? Uh, w- w- what does that mean exactly? Because who decides what is plausible, what is a plausible use of a privacy tool, and what is not a plausible use of a privacy tool? Of course, it's the government, but uh, the government is showing that it is completely willing to uh, change the definition of plausible uh, um, um, uh, in order to uh, push their own interest. For example, in the case of Tornado Cash, is it plausible that people are using Tornado Cash just for privacy reasons and not for laundry mon- and not for laundry money? Of course it is plausible. Of course it is. But that, that didn't stop the government from buying internal cash. So what exactly is plausible? We should really understand that even from a legal perspective, we are living in an in a era of, uh, of, uh, of uh, arbitrary legislation. And here I think that uh, there is an important distinction that can be made. And uh, here I borrow from uh, Bruno Leoni, who is an important uh, Italian-American philosopher and lawyer uh, who, distinguish, uh, who distinguishes between law on the one end and legislation on the other end. Law is uh, something like a natural law, uh, as, uh, as found in the private uh, Roman uh, law, for example. Law is something that is bottom-up. Uh, um, law, is, uh, 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 law is the rules that uh, happen to be in place in a society that are discovered by jurists, that are discovered by uh, judges, and that, uh, and that are not imposed by uh, any authority. Uh, law is something that is individual. If you and me have a, contra- uh, uh, have a controversy, we can choose freely to go uh, to a third party, to a judge, in order to settle this controversy. And it is something that we can do freely. It is, a bo- again, a bottom-up, uh, a bottom-up process. Uh, Leoni said, uh, said that uh, a law is also fungible uh, in the... Uh, uh, a little bit like Monero, uh, is fungible in the sense that the jurists uh, were not trying to impose their own reading about law, but basically any judge uh, will, uh, will be interchangeable because there, uh, there, there is a common understanding of what the rules are. So in, the, in this sense, the law and, the, and, and jurists are, are fungible. So on the one hand, there is law. On the, on the other end, there is legislation. A legislation is just a top-down process. Uh, 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 legislation is just arbitrary rules given by arbitrary rulers that is imposed uh, 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 that is imposed again also against the will of the people and uh, i think that nowadays you are living in the era of legislation we should uh, uh, we should come to this um, uh, to uh, to peace with the idea that uh, law at least nowadays does not really exist, and uh, all we have is legislation and uh, arbitrary rules. 
and therefore we shouldn't really trust uh, regulators uh, to do the right thing because they have so much power that can afford uh, to um, uh, overstep if I say so, low, and to just impose their own rules and uh, without uh, without regard to uh, natural rights, to privacy, to uh, to basically anything. So again, when we use the expression plausible deniability, well, it 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 has a lot of problems. And uh, uh, again, I completely agree with you. I think that uh, we should really be proud of what we are doing here. Yeah, let's let's get into the tornado cash more. That, that's why I, you know we reached out to you. Uh, yeah. We know you you know you keep an eye on these things. You work for the Monero. You do Monero policy work, right? Right for the what is the what's the group called? It's called the Monero Policy Work Group, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Well. Uh, uh, Disclaimer, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I'm really a beginner in this space. I just uh, okay. joined the uh, Monero Policy World Group and the Metrics Chat uh, recently after the MoneroCon uh, conference. Uh, I'm not a lawyer and, and I'm not a legal expert. Uh, I, I'm not uh, an Ethereum expert. Uh, so uh, I approached the Tornado Cash, uh, the Tornado Cash issue, uh, both, beca uh, both because I'm curious about the regulation aspects and uh, because uh, I, I'm reading the uh, metrics chat uh, of the uh, Monero policy work group which is very uh, which is very very interesting and also be, uh, and also because I'm a user of privacy tools and uh, basically my idea was to understand uh, uh, if and when uh, I'm going to end up in jail, basically. <laughs> so I'm trying to, to, to understand if uh, the fact that I'm using privacy tool will get me into trouble sooner or, or later. This is basically... You're deciding if you should attend the New York privacy protest or not. You're trying to decide if, it, if it's a good thing to do or... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly, exactly. Of course, it is the good, uh, it is, it is the good thing to do. I mean... <laughs> so what is your take on the tournament? We, we did a whole show on it with Peter Van Volkenberg yeah. saw that from Coin Center. They, they've been yeah. doing amazing work, you know, reacting to it. Uh, some amazing. I don't know if you've been reading all the all the posts they've been putting out. Yeah, um, absolutely. Really, yeah, really uh, yeah. good stuff. And it's nice to see them, you know, saying the M word now, right? And we heard some great things from Peter with regards to his take on Monero. So there seems like there's a lot of promise there, and that Coin Center, you know, has Monero's back. Um, yeah. But yeah, what what is your take on everything that, that that you've been witnessing so far? What's your take yeah. on Tornado Cash? Yeah, I viewed your show uh, with uh, with Peter. I read the, uh, their article. They are really really great. If uh, our viewers want a legal understanding of the issue, I definitely recommend to uh, both watch your show and uh, uh, to read their uh, their articles because uh, they, they are terrific. They are really really well written. Mm -hmm. They can be in the, they can be understood by also by common people. Uh, the only thing is is that uh, you have to take uh, the time to read them and to watch the show. That's it. But I definitely advise to uh, to read them. And um, if I, uh, if I can, I'd like to uh, share with you um, my perspective on the Tornado Cash issue by reading the press release uh, by uh, the uh, US Treasury uh, regarding the ban of, uh, of Tornado Cash. Why? Because I think that uh, reading um, regulators' words is definitely uh, the most important thing that uh, uh, that we uh, that we can do. Basically, they are banning Tornado Cash, uh, and, and therefore we must understand why they are banning and what exactly they are trying to ban. And so, as a user, uh, as a common user, I, I, I read the document, that press release, and and of course other stuff. I'm just sharing with you uh, this, but I, I read I read this, uh, that um, uh, that statement, that uh, that press release, and uh, I have to say that there are a lot of issues. Issues in uh, in uh, in that press release, and uh, uh, it opens more questions than uh, than uh, than uh, the answers uh, that uh, it uh, it gives. So, uh, if I can, I want to share it with you, and uh, and and to read some some passages, uh, some passages, of course, not all of it, but uh, and to uh, give you some comments. You have it. You can read it. Yep, it's on the stream now, so it should be there. Okay, cool. 
Okay, so I'm just going to read some sentences and just to give you uh, uh, to give you some comments uh, about them. First of all, the uh, opening sentence: uh, The U.S. Treasury says today the U.S. Department Department of the of the Treasury uh, Office of Foreign Asset Control (OFAC) san sanctioned virtual currency mixer Tornado Cash, which has been used to launder more than seven billion dollars worth of virtual currencies since its creation in 2019. So. Yeah, so here in the opening uh, in the opening statement, uh, we have huge problems. For example, they, they call Tornado Cash a mixer, but is it a mixer? And uh, I, I didn't um, uh, I, I didn't know Tornado Cash uh, really well until the uh, OFAC uh, sanctions, but it took me just a few days of research in order to understand that Tornado Cash is not really a mixer in the common sense of the world. Why? Because users are always in full control of their own coins, and uh, a user a user like me uh, never really touch uh, touches other people's coins. Never. And the same is true for other people. Other people never touches my coins when they, uh, when they use Tornado Cash. The way Tornado Cash works is uh, uh, you deposit your coins, Ethereum, Tether, USDCs, and, and, and stuff like that, into the smart contract. You get a zero knowledge proof of your deposit, and you can withdraw the money from that smart contract uh, 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 to a different address, which, thanks to the zero knowledge proof, uh, is uh, uh, unrelated to the deposit address. This is how Tornado Cash, wor uh, Tornado Cash works uh, in really simple, uh, in really simple words. So it's not a mixer. It's not a mixer because uh, it doesn't mix anything. Again, any users is uh, any user is always in full control of their own coin, uh, of their own coins. Also, uh, the figure that they give here, seven billion dollars uh, worth of uh, virtual currency, uh, is. Uh, Kind of, uh, kind of misleading because uh, Elliptic, which is a chain, a chain analysis uh, a firm, uh, uh, said that actually um, uh, seven billion dollars is just the uh, total sum of money that went through Tornado Cash during its history, and that uh, more a more likely sum of one point five billion dollars was uh, uh, was laundered th uh, through this uh, through this service. So. This may seem, uh, 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 this is a lot, of course, $1.5 billion of uh, London money, uh, money is a lot, but it also, mean that, uh, but it also means that 80% 80 of, uh, uh, of the usage of Tornado Cash is legitimate and it is for privacy reasons. So again, here we have a government agency that uh, gives a misleading definition of what they're budding and uh, gives a misleading figure in order to uh, provide an argument in favor of their of their action which wait, is let's, let's, yeah wait, let's talk about this more because i mean unfortunately you know they're they're the ones kind of calling the shots here right and uh yeah. you know they're they're saying so do we have do we know what a mixer is actually defined as i understand your your technological yeah. argument and i i i've i've recently uh have come to understand tornado cash better but actually by coin centers articles on it they've explained it re very well and you just summarized it very well and yeah. um but but is a mixer maybe in the eyes of regulators just this thing it, that you opt into to erase your transaction history? Now, whether it's technically mixing or not, uh, is that traditionally what is called a mixer, this thing that erases your transaction history? And is laundering literally just the action of trying to hide your transaction history? I don't know, is the legal, I guess the legal definition has to be with the ill intent, right? I don't think it's, it's not illegal to just, uh, you know, erase transaction history, but I guess it's illegal to do that. And then for purposes of uh, you know, because you're, you know, for you're, you're trying to hide it for, you know, whatever legal reasons, right? Because uh, you, you did something wrong. I guess that's the definite. But I, but what is your, what is your, what would be your response there? I mean, could, could it essentially be that they just determine any, any tool that you opt into to obfuscate history uh, is a mixer? Which could be, you know, which would be bad news for, you know, for things like perhaps Zcash that's opt in, you know, but perhaps arguably something like a Monero, uh, you're not mixing, right? Because there's, you're never changing. Uh, it's, it's, 
it's always the same state, right? Yeah. Uh, what is, what's your what's your take on that? Yeah, I think that um, it all comes down uh, to the definition of legislation that I gave you before. Basically, they can give whatever definition they want of what mm -hmm. a mixer is. So um, they definitely uh, have uh, uh, the first mover uh, uh, advantage here. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also think, but I also think that. Uh, they are being ambiguous on purpose here. Because, for example, in the next sentence that I underlined, they put Tornado Cash together with Blender.io, which is, of course, a completely different tool from Tornado Cash from a technical point of view. Uh, they say that they banned Tornado Cash after the, uh, ban the, the, the banning of Blender.io, but uh, Blender.io is a of course, is a custodial service, is actually a mixing service in the traditional sense, in the sense that uh, uh, you touch uh, other people's coin and uh, other people touch, uh, touch your coins. And uh, they are dropping it, uh, 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 dropping their this sentence. Um, uh, I, I can read it. Today, today's action is being taken uh, pursuant to, uh, to the executive order as amended and follows OFAC's uh, May uh, designation of virtual currency mixer Blender.io. And here it is ambiguous because it looks like Blender.io is the same thing as uh, Tornado Cash, which of course it's not, which of course it's not. Uh, but again, they are the legislators they make legislations and what decide, and they can decide to change the definition of uh, what a mixer is. And uh, with regard to the other part of your question, I think that uh, also, uh, uh, also Monero can be understood uh, as a mixer in a very broad sense, in a sense that was never used before, but in a very broad sense. And also an opt-in mixer, because well, basically, you choose to use Monero. Nobody is forcing you to use Monero. So if you use Monero, you are using a tool that protects privacy. And uh, well, if a mixer is bad because it protects privacy, well, Monero protects privacy. And uh, also, the usage of, of Monero can be understood as bad by regulators from for the same reason reason so i think that there is a lot of ambigu uh, that there is a lot of ambiguity here and uh, i also think that the fact that ofac didn't take time uh, uh, at least so far to clarify the issue here to uh, to clarify what is their definition of what a mixer is is really telling is really telling did I answer your question? <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, those are the those are the arguments against it. It's just something to think about, right? And obviously, yeah. uh, you know, this is this is what what we're trying to figure out. So the government took this action, and then we will we will see how it shakes out as people like Coin Center respond. As perhaps we see, you know we see these these things get tested in in court. Uh, we see arguments getting made, uh, and we see how it's actually defined. Um, yeah. But who who knows, you know, where it's going to go? I, I I agree with you. You know, yeah, essentially, you know, Monero could then be seen as a mixer. But that, but the thing is, Monero uh, is is akin to digital cash, right? And it's and so it's 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 fungible by nature. So that's like saying cash itself is then a mixer. Anytime somebody moves into cash. They're moving into uh, a tool for obfuscating their 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 history, you know. So so that yeah. that becomes, as opposed to saying you're using this protocol that's transparent by nature, and then uh, at moments you're moving it into this thing to erase your history. I, I know it gets a little uh, a little hairy there. It's it's kind of ridiculous to uh, <laughs> go down, um, but it's an interesting one. So what what, what are the what are the other what's the other major thing you want to point out from the article yeah yeah uh, 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 of course we, oh, yeah, uh, a bunch. all right let's go yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course with regard to monero they are thinking about monero uh, for example they say here criminals have increased their use uh, their use of anonymity and asset technology in including mixers to help hide the movement or origin of funds so basically they say that they are saying that mixers are a subset of anonymity and asset te technology and uh, i mean this kind of sentence sounds like a warning also to uh, monero people i mean uh, they are watching this kind of tools and uh, well again 
Monero can be used in order to um, to uh, break uh, pseudonymity, to break uh, to, uh, to 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 enforce, uh, sorry, uh, pseudonymity, and uh, uh, to break transparency, and therefore it can be uh, it, it can be. Um, at risk from a, a regulatory perspective. Of course, I'm not saying that it is the right thing to do to uh, regulate Monero. Of course, I think that uh, uh, regulation should be avoided at all costs. But I think that the government sooner or later will come at us, unfortunately. They are stating it quite, they, they are stating it, uh, uh, quite clearly, for example, uh, for example, in this, uh, in this sentence. Um, uh, and also, as you pointed out, uh, uh, there is also a war on cash raging nowadays, right? They are trying to abolish cash and they are trying to force everyone to, towards the use of digital payment system and towards CBDCs and stuff like that. So, I mean, we can say that uh, they are pretty serious about this stuff. And uh, again, it's legislation, not law, but still we, uh, we have to deal with it. So so let me ask you though, so, and you can continue on after. Uh, so do yeah. you think... It, it could potentially go down in a way where the U.S. government goes after only Monero and not Bitcoin, or is it if you go after Monero now you're you basically banned code, you ban you know <laughs> which is already, it's yeah, already yeah, yeah. now with Tornado Cash, right? But it, now it's an even more egregious. You're, you're banning a protocol that's arguably the same exact thing as Bitcoin. You're banning a decentralized. Yeah. Uh, you know, protocol tool that that's used for communicating value. Uh, why is why is how are you banning Monero, but then you're not also banning Bitcoin? Do you or is it that they go after everything? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I think that banning Monero is way more difficult than banning Monero uh, than banning Tornado Cash. Because again, uh, Monero is a decentralized cryptocurrency. It, it is a, a, they, they need to ban the whole network, which is not the same as banning a tool that can be used on the network. So it, it will be more egregious, uh, as uh, um, uh, as you said. Uh, but again, we, we are witnessing nowadays uh, very egregious things. Uh, and uh, I, I'm a bit pessimistic about it. I'm not a lawyer again, but my feeling is that sooner or later, uh, some sort of ban uh, of Monero will come, at least in some jurisdictions. Um, this is just my, uh, of course, this is just my two cents. Uh, uh, with regard to Bitcoin, uh, I don't think that they will ban Bitcoin uh, because I think that uh, it is in their interest not to ban it. Because Bitcoin is a transparent cryptocurrency, and uh, actually 99% of people use Bitcoin in the wrong way. And therefore, uh, uh, basically, the government has a terrific tool for them to track people and to um, know everything uh, about their finances. And so if you are a government, why would you ban a tool that can help you in uh, tracking uh, your, tra your, citizens, uh, your citizens' money? I wouldn't ban it. And uh, I think that uh, in this sense, Bitcoin may become a tool that can be used by the government uh, uh, for uh, enforcing uh, their, uh, their regulations. Of course, this is not to say that uh, they will not ban some tools that can be used on the Monero blockchain, as for example, I don't know, Whirlpool or uh, mixers that, can, uh, uh, that exist uh, in Bitcoin. But I don't think that it is in the interest of, uh, of uh, regulators to ban Bitcoin. As well, I, I don't think, for example, it is in the interest of regulators to ban Ethereum. They didn't ban Ethereum. I think for the same reason, because they can see everything that happens on the Ethereum blockchain. They are banning Tornado Cash, which uh, makes uh, Ethereum less transparent. How about something like Zcash? Do you see a potential distinction there? Like, you know, is it more friendly to regulators? Uh, you know, the way it's currently set up with its opt-in privacy? Uh, well, I think that uh, Zcash, again, uh, people that use uh, Zcash in the correct way, uh, I'm not expert at all in Zcash, but as far as I understand, the vast majority of the, uh, majority of the people uses Zcash as uh, they use Bitcoin. So uh, the percentage of uh, shielded address and shielded transaction is very low. So if you're the government, why should you ban a tool that can actually help you track people? I wouldn't do that. 
Um, Doesn't this just become a, a redo of the privacy wars that you know happened in the '90s with PGP? So they they you know how is this not become analogous to that? And you know I agree. And uh, don't get me wrong. I I, yeah. I, I I see I see it playing out this way too, right? The, the government isn't threatened by Bitcoin. It's a it's a surveillance coin, right? Um, uh, maybe they're threatened by the tools that integrate with Bitcoin. Um, yeah. And I get that, but we do have a constitution. We do have, you know, we do have these things, but will all that get thrown out of the, out, out the window for quote unquote national security reasons? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Um, <laughs> well, um, uh, unfortunately here again, just my two cents. I'm yeah, just your two cents. I, I, yeah, yeah. obviously you don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can just guess that. I mean, in the U.S., the Constitution is re- is something that is really important. But for example, uh, this is not the case in most European countries where constitutional protections are uh, way lower than uh, than in the U.S. And also, uh, I would say that uh, even in the U.S. As far as I understand, uh, the Constitution uh, is uh, not always respected. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, in the Constitution it is said, it is written that uh, the only um, allowed money, the only constitutional money are gold and silver, uh, if I'm not wrong. And still we have the Federal Reserve and still we have a, a fiat system. Uh, which uh, which some people would say uh, is unconstitutional, but I can be completely wrong. So uh, so please again correct me uh, if I'm saying something uh, something really stupid. Yeah, uh, but, I, but, 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 but but in general, I, I just think that yeah, I, I mean the constitution is important, but it's becoming more and more legislation, and uh, they can just twist the meaning of the words in the constitution and try to use them at their own advantage. Unfortunately, I, I don't really trust the, the, so much the law, even though I think that um, I, I Coin Center uh, and uh, all the people that uh, fight the legal battle, uh, the, the legal battles should continue to fight them because uh, those battles uh, slow them down. And uh, the cypherpunk wars were a great example of uh, those successful battles. And uh, I hope that uh, they will be successful too in the case of Turner Cash. Of course. Awesome. You want to keep going through the document? Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, Again, uh, another important sentence here. Tornado Cash has repeatedly failed to impose effective control design to stop it from laundering funds from uh, formal issued cyber actors on a regular basis and without basic measures to address its risk. Again, this sentence is very weird because uh, it is implying that Tornado Cash is an entity. But actually, it is not. As Peter said on your uh, on your uh, on your show, Tornado Cash, uh, at least the Tornado Cash smart contracts, pools, uh, pool smart contracts, are just robots. They are completely permissionless. Um, people don't need uh, to ask permission to anybody uh, to uh, use Tornado Cash. It is non-custodial. Again, there is no one that takes custody of users' funds. It is completely deterministic. Uh, the Tornado Cash uh, smart contracts just perform some operation in a deterministic way, and therefore, uh, the, uh, which cannot be changed. And also, those smart contracts are completely immutable. They cannot be uh, changed by anyone, not even by Tornado Cash devs, not even by the uh, Tornado Cash cash DAO. uh, DAO. So the question is, who exactly is supposed to impose those effective controls that uh, that OFAC is talking about? Who exactly is supposed uh, is supposed to impo- impose those controls? It's like uh, it's like the U.S. Treasury is as- asking something that is literally impossible, and it is impossible for technical reasons that cannot be changed. And so here again, a very strange uh, statement. Also, a little uh, a little parenthesis. Um, again, um, among the addresses that were uh, that were uh, that were banned uh, of Tornado Cash. Uh, um, uh, we cannot find the uh, DAO smart contract. So uh, some people on Twitter and, say, and uh, in different places uh, said that a Tornado Cash can be banned because there is a DAO that controls the functioning of uh, smart contracts. Well, actually, this is not true. The DAO cannot control the functioning, uh, the, the functioning of the um, uh, most important smart contracts, uh, which are pool contracts, uh, which uh, defines the rules of the 
quote unquote mixing. And also the smart contract that uh, sets the rules for the DAO is not banned, is not sanctioned. So here again, there is a lot of confusion that- uh, okay. uh, uh, is... No, it is. It's among the sanctioned addresses, no? Uh, I read that, that it is not. Again, this, this information is taken from an article from Coin Center. So oh. uh, I think yeah. that the DAO is not sanctioned. And uh, also, also, for yeah, example- The DAO or the smart contracts that hold the pool? The, they're, they're all, my understanding is they're, they're all listed as, as being sanctioned. Uh, my understanding is that uh, there are 43 address, addresses that are sanctioned. Mm -hmm. 21 of them are the pools, which are the, uh, the, yes. uh, the okay. most important so ones. The pools weren't. Okay. You're saying yeah. the, DAO, the DAO is one of the... Yeah, yeah. The, but, but the DAO is not one of them. The, okay. Then there are uh, other smart contracts that are, uh, that are banned. Uh, for example, uh, two donation addresses, some uh, uh, non-updated uh, smart contracts, uh, some smart contracts that are not actually used, some ancillary smart contracts, but not the DAO, uh, the DAO smart contract. Also, for example, the token, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, often talked about uh, because, I mean, uh, for example, developers earned money uh, because of tornado cash because there is this token which is called the torn well the smart contracts that cover that, that governs the functioning of the token is not among the ones uh, the ones that are sanctioned so again there is a lot of confusion here because they are talking about tornado cash as as if it is a single entity but actually it is a very complex tool and uh, they don't explain what exactly they banned so uh, this is another point uh, can I go on uh, j j j just very, uh, just very qu uh, quickly? I yeah, don't yeah. want to, please, uh, to please borrow uh, too much time. Please and um, again, um, uh, another, another important sentence here. While the, purpose, uh, while the purpose, purpose is to increase privacy, mixers like Tornado are commonly used by illicit actor, uh, actors to launder, uh, to launder funds. Again, here the question that, sh that we should ask is, uh, what is the role of privacy according to, Hoffa, uh, to OFAC? Because they seem to consider Tornado Cash as a tool for laundering, for laundering money and that's it. And they say, well, yes, you can also use Tornado Cash for privacy, but basically we don't care about it because we are banning Tornado Cash uh, uh, um, uh, uh, fully, completely, and uh, we are also banning the legitimate use of Tornado Cash because any American citizen that interacts with the pools of Tornado Cash are interacting uh, is interacting with a sanctioned entity. So here they are just saying, well, yeah, yeah, I, we know that uh, Tornado Cash we can uh, can be used uh, for privacy, but still we don't care because for us Tornado Cash is just used by criminals and therefore we ban everything which is kind of uh, telling uh, about their understanding uh, of uh, privacy and their consideration of privacy. And uh, again, uh, uh, other sentences that, uh, um, uh, again, um, are pretty clear in the fact that uh, OFAC seems to think that uh, uh, Tornado Cash is an entity that can materially assist or sponsor or support uh, the uh, users uh, in order to land their funds when, of course, Tornado Cash is not an entity. So this is important because, I mean, this kind of language is found everywhere in these documents. And again, it brings more confusion than, than clarity. And uh, yeah, this is the uh, sentence that I wanted to talk about uh, about Monero, but we already dealt with it. And uh, also, also this uh, this part. I just have two last points to to say. So, uh, just to uh, the, 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 this uh, um, this uh, sentence, the industry should take a risk-based approach to assess the risk associated with different virtual currency services, implement measures to mitigate risk, and address the challenges anonymizing, anonymizing features can present to compliance with MAL CFT obligations. As today's actions demonstrate, mixers should in general be considered as high risk by virtual currency firms. We should only process transactions if they have appropriate controls in place to prevent mixers from being used to, used to, launder, uh, to, to launder illicit proceeds. 
This is kind of interesting because here OFAC is uh, uh, making a, refer a reference to the FAFT, to the Financial Action Task Force uh, uh, guidance uh, um, regarding uh, uh, virtual assets and virtual assets uh, service uh, providers, where basically uh, FAFT, which is uh, uh, the uh, gold standard of regulations about uh, MAL and uh, um, uh, and uh, and of course the regulation of cryptocurrency um, the, uh, outlines this kind of risk-based uh, approach. And uh, I want just to underline the meaning of this, of this term, this uh, risk-based approach. What they're saying is basically that anyone that, uh, use, uh, that uses a privacy service is a risk. For example, Coinbase should, con should consider any customer that, uh, that interact with privacy tool not as a customer, but as a risk. And uh, this is getting even, even more, um, uh, even more uh, outrageous uh, with the uh, Tornado Cash sanctions, because it is not only that people using privacy preservative tools are risk uh, and actually high risk, according to the FAFT and to, uh, to, uh, to uh, OFAC, but uh, they are also kind of guilty by default. Again, OFAC bans any US citizen from interacting with Tornado Cash smart contracts, any US citizens, even uh, low abiding citizens and people that, that did anything wrong, that did not, do, uh, did not do anything wrong. So here we are, we are, re, uh, we are witnessing a situation in which, um, first of all, people should be uh, innocent by default, but then people became risky by default if they use a privacy tool, and then they almost, beca uh, they almost became guilty by default if they use, uh, if they use a privacy tool, With a th uh, which I think is uh, a pretty big step in the wrong, in the wrong dire uh, direction. We should be very, very careful about this because it is really uh, a, slipper, a slippery uh, slope. And... Um, Okay, and uh, the last point that I want to make, and uh, then I stop uh, bothering you. <laughs> uh, um, this one, uh, this one, last a creepy sentence. The ultimate goal of sanctions is not to punish, but to bring about a positive change in behavior. I mean, this sounds a little bit Orwellian. They're saying that they want to educate us. Uh, they want to build the homo novus, uh, the, uh, a new kind of man. The, the, uh, they want to shape our minds. I mean, come on. Uh, uh, is the government supposed to uh, bring about a positive change in behavior of the people and to change the behavior of the people? And what is a positive behavior? I mean, uh, this is, I think, pretty Orwellian on the one end, uh, and uh, again, I think that it sums up the approach of the government. In the yeah, yeah, that's, 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 <laughs> that's, well, they're, they're talking about in terms of, you know, being removed from the sanction list, which, which is... Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Of uh, course, yeah, that's, that's, that's the whole thing with sanctions. I mean, it's strict liability, like you said. So uh, anybody who interacts and, and breaks the sanction is breaking the law, whether or not they were... Yeah, we're up to no good. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter what their motives were. Um, but so, do, do you just I, uh, do you agree with that whole concept? Just the concept of a sanction, whether or not it's applied to Monero or Tornado Cash. Just uh, what's what's your opinion of sanctions in general, and the fact that uh, basically the balance becomes national security versus you know uh, government being able to do whatever the hell they want because of national security. I mean. Um, do you think there is room for that and justification for, for such policies like that? Or just the whole idea of a sanction, the whole, I, you know, is, is it uh, unethical and perhaps unconstitutional? Yeah, I definitely think, of course, uh, it is uh, unethical in the sense that, um, I mean, money is just free speech and uh, anyone should be allowed to transact with each other in a free manner, in a completely free manner. And... Uh, of course, uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, uh, punish, uh, as Ofak said, uh, criminals and uh, money launderers. But I think that um, it is one thing to uh, uh, have some evidence against uh, one individual that did something wrong and to try to uh, punish him. 
And it is a completely different matter to um, label, even label, uh, a privacy tool as risky because someone may, in some circumstances, uh, use that privacy tool. Those are two very different matters. I mean, of course, the law should go uh, should go after actual criminals and uh, uh, should uh, go after criminals only if they have evidence of guilt. That's it. But to sanction a tool that can be used basically by anyone because it's permissionless and uh, uh, fortunately, it's, it's still used nowadays. Tornado Cash is still used nowadays, uh, d- despite the, uh, the, existence of, uh, the existence of the sanctions. Uh, well, I mean, it's it, it's just not lawful in my perspective. In, in my perspective, it's just about the natural law. It's it goes against natural law and uh, the right to property, and uh, I think also common sense. Awesome, man. Um... I don't know. I, th- I think we covered a lot there. You went, you went through, yeah. you went through the whole document. Anything else you want to bring up with regards to the topic? Where- uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, ju- just to conclude, uh, I want to uh, bring a little bit of optimism to uh, to this conversation because I said a lot of pessimistic uh, pessimistic stuff. And uh, as the says going, I mean, pessimist sounds ma- sound smart, but op- optimist gets money. So um, it's important to uh, finish with an optimist mode. And I think that uh, despite the attempt uh, from the government to ban privacy, uh, privacy tool, uh, privacy tools will be used. Tornado Cash is still being used nowadays. If you go on Twitter, for example, and you look for Tornado Bot, you see that uh, there are a lot of money that are being uh, moved in Tornado Cash uh, smart contracts, uh, even nowadays, even millions of dollars per day. Um, I think that um, they, they are trying to make uh, to make Tornado Cash an example, like in the case of, for example, of Ross, uh, of Ross Ulbricht. They, uh, the, the punishment of Ross Ulbricht is, of course, uh, uh, beyond belief uh, for, a vict- for, for a victimless uh, crime. Uh, but they did it anyway in order to scare people. But still, even the fact that they uh, did that to, uh, to Ross Ulbricht uh, didn't stop the existence of uh, uh, dark net markets, of, uh, of freedom uh, on the internet, and again, People can still use Tornado Cash. Uh, what is banned actually is, is the front end of Tornado Cash. But uh, smart people, not me, but technical people can can still use uh, can still use Tornado Cash. And uh, black markets will always exist just because freedom is part of human nature. And if people want something, well, you can buy, you can ban it um, as much as you want. But I mean, freedom in the end will always win. So uh, let's fight for freedom. Awesome, man. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, man. Where can, where can people follow you, learn more about uh, what, what you're working on? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any social account. Actually, I, I, I have some social account, but just for reading. So I, I don't post anything. Okay. Uh, but uh, soon, I hope, uh, uh, there will be two academic uh, papers from, uh, from me uh, that will be published on, some, uh, on, a, on a couple of academic journals. And uh, that they also mention Monero. Oh, okay. And uh, so uh, if people are interested, uh, can uh, they maybe can read those uh, articles. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have any social, uh, uh, any active uh, social account, unfortunately. What are, what are these papers? Are, are they things that we t- touched upon yeah. today? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in, in part, yes, in part, yes, not the tornado cash situation. Uh, one paper is on the war on privacy mm-hmm. and uh, is uh, in the late st- stage of the peer review, uh, peer review process. And uh, uh, the, other, uh, the other paper is, the, um, is about the definition of privacy as invisibility by default, which I discussed also at, uh, at MoneroCon. And uh, it is in the copy editing stage, so it will should uh, it should be out soon. Um, so um, uh, very, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> very cool, man. What, what what is what is the you know the thesis of of each uh, of each paper? If you if you, you want to give the quick. Uh... <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, in, in the case of uh, the paper on privacy and visibility by default, uh, I urge uh, I urge your viewers to uh, look uh, at the um, video from uh, regarding the Monero Com presentation, uh, which is not out yet, but uh, you can look. For it. Yeah, I, I, missed, yeah. I missed your presentation that day. Uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah. I, I saw your I got, yeah. got your slides, but. Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, and, and I and basically I just discussed the definition of privacy as, invis as invisibility by, uh, by default, and I try to uh, put it uh, in the context of, of uh, classical uh, definitions of privacy, and uh, uh, I'm trying to give my understanding uh, of that notion from a philosophical perspective. The other paper uh, is the war on privacy, so I try to. Uh, um, um, uh, the, uh, um, I, I, I discuss the war, the war on privacy from a political and social aspect. For example, uh, I don't know the digital uh, the, the digital ID stuff and, uh, and and things like that. And uh, basically, uh, I discuss uh, again why privacy is important for libertarians to fight for. And uh, the context here is the uh, Rothbardian the theory of strategy for liberty. And uh, I just state that uh, privacy should be uh, the main focus of libertarians in order to fight for liberty. And uh, um, uh, because uh, so far it is, uh, it was, uh, it has been a little bit underrated. And um, privacy should get the proper place in the theory. Of, of strategy for liberty awesome man thank you so much that's a good way to round it out right back to where, where we started from <laughs> yeah exactly thank you so much man greatly appreciate it and thank uh, you thank you too thank you for having me it was a pleasure and uh you, you're doing a, a an awesome work i always follow you on your uh, on your podcast so thanks for your work it's really thank, important thank you man and uh hopefully i'll see you at a, another monero event yeah hopefully so yeah Cheers, man. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.